So welcome back to the Raising Our Vibration podcast, where we explore higher consciousness through spiritual practice. So the subject for Stephen and I today is Rupert Spira or Kuladasa, Mahamudra or Zojin. Why not both? So that's how we're framing it. And so I'm going to start by talking a little about the approach, the uh, difference between what has been called the progressive path and what has been called the direct path. So on the one side, you have um, Rupert Spira, who is uh, currently a, a big proponent of what's called the direct path. And his, his approach is really to go straight for a direct, intuitive apprehension of the nature of our being. So by asking the question, who am I? And there's a great tradition to that question, who am I? And really inquiring into the nature of this awareness that we are. And so that is, in a sense, a very simple, uh, very direct approach. And it can awaken a deep insight pretty quickly, pretty readily. Um, and on the other side, we have a progressive approach as, uh, so uh, the book, Being Aware of Being Aware by Rupert Spira is a great example of that. And on the other side, we have uh, a book by Kuladasa, uh, AKA John Yates, who uh, describes a progressive path in the mind illuminated. Uh, I have that one digitally, so I can't show you that one, but the mind illuminated. And in the mind illuminated, uh, Kuladasa is, his goal is to train attention and what he calls peripheral awareness. So it's training attention and peripheral awareness as a foundation of your practice. And he has a very, just a wonderful description of the steps of that. So he has uh, six steps of preparation for your practice, and then some practical setup steps, and then a four steps of transition to your meditative object. So beginning with present moment awareness, aware of the open awareness of the whole field, and then awareness of body sensations, while maintaining awareness of the whole field. And then third, awareness of breath sensations while maintaining peripheral awareness of the whole field. And then finally, going to this one-pointed awareness of the breath at the tip of the nose while maintaining uh, peripheral awareness. So he has this, this uh, dual training of one-pointed attention within a space of peripheral awareness. And that training has profound benefits in terms of training stable attention, your ability to concentrate and focus, and as well as your ability to become aware of when you're distracted and to return to focus. And so it's, and he describes 10 stages that you go through on this path of training attention and awareness. And so it's a wonderfully, uh, wonderful exposition of a progressive path that trains inner skills of attention within a wide awareness and uses that as a foundation for insight practice. So in the mind illuminated, and uh, Kuladasa has said this himself, he's really focused on the attention aspect. Although he, he's always including peripheral awareness, and then at the end, he has um, uh, mention of, of going further into insight practices and, and so on. Um, so he's really seeing this training of attention specifically and awareness as a foundation for deeper insights and, um, and transformation. Um, so... What are the pitfalls of that? Well, when you look at, and he even asks you to do this, to 
go through the different stages and kind of identify where you are, okay? So there can be a tendency to, well, you know, what would you do when you're looking at the 10 stages of meditation as a meditator? Well, you want to see how high you are in those stages, right? How far along am I? And you're going to want to, it's very easy to be attached to, oh, these are the 10 stages and I want to be up here. And it's, you maybe tend to overestimate where you are in those 10 stages. And there's a strong um, tendency to become attached to that structure and moving along that structure and where am I in the structure and identification and so on. So while it's a, it's a wonderful progression and very important in terms of training attention and training the foundational skills of attention and awareness, which are essential, it has its pitfalls. So that's where the direct approach comes in and kind of undercuts all of that and, and goes directly for this direct inquiry of insight into who am I. And so you, in that, you kind of, you, um, kind of step around that those pitfalls of attachment and attainment and levels and identification. Um, but at the same time, with the direct approach, there's a pitfall of you're not training attention. You're not um, uh, progressively going through a process which will, if you're on a progressive process, what's going to happen in that process, and the majority of the book, The Mind Illuminated, is, well, here's what happens as you do that process. All this stuff comes up. There's resistance that comes up. There's old stories that come up. There's uh, accumulated lifetime of tensions that come into awareness, and you work with those through attention and awareness. So there's this really depth of processing that happens in a progressive path that doesn't necessarily happen in a direct approach where you're just going right for that aha uh, realization. And so Stephen and I have found that what's really beneficial is why not both? It's, it's both have their benefits, okay? And so why not incorporate them into one system? And that's what we've, uh, done with our subtle energy meditation meditation training system is that we do have this progressive approach of steps where we're we have preparation of your body environment and intention initiation of your practice with uh, posture relaxation and positive energy cues a focus on concentration on energy centers and pathways into absorption a letting go into transcendence, a returning and grounding into the body so the awareness is really embodied, and then a process of reflection and insight so you gather the insights from your practice, and then you consciously carry it out into the world in compassionate action. So in that way, we're drawing all that together into, into one unified system and there's and so it's one whole integrated practice that is progressive and also right in the heart of it is awareness itself practice in that transcendent step where we're resting as awareness itself where we are becoming attuned to that felt sense of awareness itself right in the heart of the practice. And then it's, there's a process to lead up to that and there's a process to integrate that. Uh, so with that as a lead in, Stephen, you know, that was a lot, but uh, you're gonna talk about a little about uh, Mahamudra and Zojin practice, how they fall into that, um, that continuum between direct approach and progressive approach. And uh, so we'll, I'll pass it to you to go from there. Uh, thank you, Kevin. Thank you. And, and love and blessings to everybody that's listening or watching. And really, this is a very rich and deep and, and especially profound subject, because 
just as Kevin was saying, there is there are progressive approaches that suit certain people, and there are also direct approaches that suit certain people. And I do always remember Mingyur Rimshe pointing out about how different styles suit different personalities. Uh, and so one of the, you know, if we would look at it in that manner, that the, these two very traditional Tibetan Buddhist paths of Mahamudra, which means the great seal, and Zojin, which means the great perfection, one, which is Mahamudra, is a much more progressive path. In fact, it fairly closely aligns with training attention and discovering awareness, actually understanding that awareness is always present. And you do this in a very progressive way, and you essentially arrive at the same point on the mountain as you do in all the other parts, right? It's, you're still arriving at the same point. You're doing it through a particularly progressive way of understanding it. And I'll outline that in just a moment. And the Zojin path uh, is much more direct. In fact, it's a particular practice in Tibetan called trecho or cutting through. And it means you cut straight through the pass. <laughs> you don't climb the whole mat. You just go, boom, straight to the straight to the point uh, and that's very much the that direct inquiry pro, um, path and, and it's very very direct which is of course it appeals to certain people that like to do that and both of them have their uh, I guess their aspects that can be helpful and if you don't actually understand the practice can actually also be challenging along the way so if you look at um, Mahamudra first Mahamudra has a, a very uh, classical progressive path. You, you start off with understanding what Mahamudra itself is and how there is a ground and a path and a fruition kind of stage. And, you, you, and, and as part of that, devotion is really key and it's part of the beginning aspects of the path. And in those beginning aspects, you learn lots of preliminaries, like, and just as Kevin said, as we teach in raising our vibration, preliminaries about how to prepare, how to sit, how to get ready, posture, breathing practices, and so on. So those are really crucial because the preliminaries actually set you up. And again, they're progressive. And then you go into a stage where you learn how to meditate on the breath. And you learn this breathing meditation. You learn the essence of the breath, you learn how to do these breathing practices. And these are what are often known as shamada practices. You learn how to do them with support. So that's training attention on a particular focal object. And you also learn how to do them without support. So that is without any kind of focal object. You then start to understand, oh, okay, my attention can be tight and it can be loose. So you learn those parts of your personality. Oh, my, I tend to draw my attention a lot tighter on objects, or I tend to loosen. And if you're a little tight, you learn to loosen. If you're a little loose, you learn to tighten. And I always thought that was a very beautiful part of the process because you actually understand more about your own, the quality of your own signature. And I think that's something we've spoken a lot about when we're looking at brainwaves, that you start to learn about the quality of your own being. And Kevin, you might want to say something about that at this point, because that's, that's really crucial, that you're really, people often point to it being a particular part, oh, this is the one way. <laughs> this is, but in fact, we keep pointing out that that tightening, learning actually to be adaptable, flexible, learning to be able to shift are really crucial points in this. Yeah, absolutely. And that, that's really the heart of this uh, LLP meditation, which is the culmination, so to speak, of our, our subtle energy meditation series, is that it is this alternation between uh, concentrating, focusing attention, and, and then resting in an open awareness. So there's the kind of activating and energizing aspect of the practice, the concentration of the practice, the one-pointedness of the practice. And then there's kind of the stillness, the pacifying part of the practice, the calming part of the practice, and an alternation between 
different ways of doing those with the end being arresting as uh, awareness itself. So um, learning how to modulate attention, right? Learning what your attention is and how to work with it in various different ways. So you're not stuck on one focal object um, because that can be that can be a sticking point in meditation too. You so groove one focal point that that kind of becomes what meditation is for you. You kind of think, oh, well, meditation is this technique that I have mastered. And so one of the things we do in subtle energy meditation is move through a series of focal objects so that we develop flexible attention and learn to monitor our attention within a wider awareness. So we are aware of, oh, my attention is here now. Oh, my attention has wandered off. Now my attention is here. Now my want attention has wandered off here. Now I'm going to move to a different focal object. So I don't just get locked in on one thing. And I developed this ability to consciously focus on anything, consciously let go, consciously move attention, and within a wide space of awareness, which is keeping track of all of that. And so I, I think that's um, that's how we're, we're combining all of this to see that, yeah, there's there, and there's, like you said, there different people are going to, um, feel more comfortable with different aspects of the practice. Some people really love to just hone in on one spot and concentrate, and they have these minds that can really concentrate, but the, those minds can also get stuck. Right. And then some people more are great at just resting in this open awareness and being aware of everything at once, or even just being aware of this diffused awareness, but may tend to be kind of drifting in their life and having a hard time with intention and focus and so on. So again, these two parts of the practice are so beneficial, right, to be able to tighten in and to be able to loosen out, as you uh, said, is a, a big part of the Mahamudra practice. Kevin, I think you've just spoken to also one of the key elements to, you know, keep in mind all through this is that often your life becomes a reflection of exactly what your state of uh, consciousness is. So the awareness that you're open to, when your life has that effortless flowing and free space to move in, then it, it's a really good reflection. If you look at your, I, I know when I stayed with Tenzin Wang Yoram Shea, he always used to say, you know, be really open to your relationships. Look at your relationships as a reflection of how you deal with life, because then you can look at, oh, where are you too tight? Where are you too loose? Where, where, where do you need to open up more? So, and, and also as you were discussing about the states, you know, even states like bliss, or clarity or emptiness, we can be very sure that, oh, I'm blissful, I'm blissful, and get really, really stuck and focused in that groove, or, oh, everything's so clear, and I, I, I know that's what the state I want, and be very fixed on being this, this luminous clarity all the time, or uh, empty, oh, I, you know, I got no thought, there's nothing there, <laughs> I'm, I'm empty, right, and, and actually right. get stuck. to identify with a state like that right exactly and and get stuck on oh well, that's what it is rather than seeing that it's all about awareness within which all these states arise and we can be skillful about how we use our attention with awareness exactly the the and in fact that is the next stage of mahamudra itself that which once you understand the loosening and tightening of your own practice and your own, the way you bring attention, you're then introduced to Vipassana. And Vipassana is where you look at the mind, you start to investigate your thoughts and perceptions, and you start to see that thoughts arise, they abide, they dissolve, but they're not permanent. You start to actually understand that. You also start to investigate the degree of stillness and movement in your practice. So. So it, 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 just as you were saying, sometimes we can be very sure that ah, stillness is it. All I need to do is be still. And then, of course, when you start to move in the marketplace of 
society with your friend, you suddenly get thrown right off. Oh, I can't, I can't. So you start to really look at, okay, where's this balance? I think that's why the Buddha often spoke about this as being the you know, middle way, but you start to really understand the importance of balancing. So you investigate that too. You investigate your thoughts, your feelings, perceptions, and you also investigate the degree to which you, the stillness or this quietitude or this equanimity can be brought into movement. And so that becomes really a powerful part of the practice. And at that point, when you've done this investigation, which is, which is known as Vipassana, um, you then turn to pointing out the nature of mind itself. So by doing this, and this is really the point at which uh, Rup Rupert Spirit speaks straight to attention, that you turn attention inwards. And as you do that, you start to turn attention back on itself and it begins to dissolve because at some point you recognize there is no solid self. The, the, all these ideas and perceptions and pasts and futures that you've previously thought were so, so you. That so substantial. And so right. substantial, right? Mm -hmm. You start to see, because once you recognize, this is the importance of Vipassana and the Mahamudra path, is once you recognize the insubstantiality of your thoughts and perceptions and fear, then you naturally are going to make the next step when you're continuing to ask this, who am I uh, question, which you do as a matter of course in the Vipassana part of the practice, then you start to recognize that the eye that you've built up stories and narratives and all sorts of ideas and concepts around actually is also insubstantial. You can't, if you arrive at the the natural conclusion that, that your thoughts are insubstantial because you actually experience them arising and dissolving, then you equally start to realize that the stories that you've hung on to for so long about I'm this or I'm that are actually just concepts. And that is a really big aha point because at the moment, at that point, then the attention begins to turn inwards towards what is there when you leave your past future ideas and concepts aside you know, and that's a wonderful moment of the direct path is they start right there what what if you set aside your past and your expectations of the future and your thoughts and your your history and even your body and your thoughts and your feelings and your set all that aside and what remains Exactly, exactly, exactly. And what that what remains is where the, the strength of your practice up to this point and the degree of trust that you have in the practice itself takes over because that last step of what remains is non-conceptual, is, is unbound. It does not lie in the mind. And so you, you actually surrender to whatever it is that lies beyond. Be, it's almost like the... Uh, uh, Indiana Jones step onto the unknown the, the it looks like it's a chasm but when you step on there of course there is actually a step but you can't see it until you decide you're going to take the leap of faith or, or trust and so this is where the the deep trust in your practice up to this point actually starts to sing to the to the and this is partly why the progressive path practitioners speak about the importance of this and is that foundation and that enables you to really make that inquiry in a way that's beyond concept it's like kuladas is in at every point in his four steps of transition he's focusing not on the thoughts but on the sensations Exactly. Right. The sensations of the present moment, the sensations of the body, the sensations of the breath within the felt sense of peripheral awareness. Exactly. And it, and it is at that point, as we also point out in the raising of vibration practice, that there is a sense of transcendence because you begin to realize that no matter what arises, all of that is wisdom, all of that. You, you can make adversity your path. You can make struggle your path just as equally as you can make joy your path. The, 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 
at this point, the strengthening of your practice really begins to come in because you start to recognize that whatever arises is just simply what's present. And you're no longer making judgment. You're no longer pushing it away, nor are you trying to grab onto it. You've actually reached that, if you want to, that balance, that middle, pa middle path or that middle way. You actually genuinely, as a direct experience, know exactly what the Buddha or any of these great masters or yogis or yoginis meant when they meant that every part of what arises within awareness is actually the path is actually self-liberating in that sense because once you recognize that we tend to think oh it's just the the bliss states mm -hmm. that are <laughs> self-liberating right. right but, but that's, that's where it all where it all it's um you have the realization that it's all one right that it's it's not about having a bliss state versus a a depressive state it's not about that that any state can be held felt within this wide space of awareness and used as a portal through to awareness itself and to recognition of how all states arise and dissolve exactly and and in fact so that allows me to switch albeit a little briefly to the zojin or the direct path because the zojin point actually starts from this view and it starts from the view that we are fundamentally pure that we are actually fundamentally limitless and open and vast and that that view is where we begin so the in in zojin there is not the same progressive meditation you don't do the shamada practices of tightening and loosening and step-by-step -step meditation like we do in mahamudra in fact what we do is we look at directly at what the nature of our mind of our heart of awareness itself is and this is rupert's direct approach we look directly at it there's not so much of the step by step practice and as i mentioned there is this treacher or, or cutting through direct pointing to the nature of mind to as awareness itself so we undoubtedly have to have some kind of foundational practice and this is why in many of the ancient tibetan traditions they do teach mahamudra first they actually encourage and this is really what we've done in raising a vibration we encourage a process as part of that coming to that direct inquiry that and that's what, and shamatha is the is the foundation for vipassana right and they merge exactly. seamlessly um, some would say that one just seamlessly becomes the other um, or you can see them as you know training of attention awareness and insight practice um, and would, wouldn't you say that um, in the teacher tibetan teachers that you've studied with they are using both commonly mahamudra and zojin and would you say that's pretty common yeah it's very very i i did it that with the dalai lama i studied that way and with Mingyu Rinpoche studied that way and with Tenzin Wangyu Rinpoche studied all, all three of them so they uh, in Mingyu, Mingyu Rinpoche has probably got the strictest part you have to do Mahamudra before you can do the Zojin practice so you have to learn and more or less be tested on your ability to have that progressive deepening of attention into awareness and, and understand exactly what that means and be able to demonstrate it. Um, and in fact, the number of teachers that I've learned with over the years, they required you to demonstrate that. They'd get you to very carefully explain. Now, of course, these days there seems to be more, when I did this some 30 or 40 years ago, there's, I, I was able to meet with them personally and ask direct questions of, for example, the Dalai Lama, which was quite helpful. These days, it's maybe not so easy to get, <laughs> directly but now i've noticed with the advent of zoom so i noticed that that 
transition. You know, there were more and more students that would come because when I started with Fidel Alam, there were very few. And now there's more and more and more people that know. But with the advent of Zoom, especially on some of the retreats, um, when, I, when I first did it again, I was able to talk to them, uh, the Lamas directly. And now they tend to ask for questions and then they'll answer long lists of people's questions. There is, so there is the opportunity to really ask directly about your practice. Because I actually do think that's quite crucial. And it's something that we do a lot of in the Raising Our Vibration course. I think that's, you know, when I think to the heart of what really helped me, there's been a few times in my life when, you know, a Lama or a Yogi or a Swami or a Rinpoche would point to me directly to something, you know, either in person or, or virtually, but I was able to speak to them and they'd just come straight back with an answer. I think that as part of this progressive path, I think it's really crucial to be able to ask your personal questions and have them answered. And I know the conversation we are having here came from one wonderful practitioner's inquiry. Exactly. Into exactly. This. Right, right. This, this uh, podcast developed out of uh, a question asked by one of our uh, participants and, and actually someone who's in our teacher training program now and about uh, uh, dullness and meditation practice, which we talked about last week, and about um, the progressive versus the direct approach. So it's, yeah, it's that ability to ask those questions that um, directly um, to, you know, a live person that, that really uh, stimulates the whole community, right? Um, this, it brings forth um, a wealth of information from and within and for the whole community. Beautiful. It is, it is. And Kevin, I just thought perhaps just as an ending point for this, I could do a very short practice which helps people understand the Zojin way of directly in, introducing you to, to this. So it's just really the very early beginning stages of it because essentially what happens in Zojin is that Always, whenever we do Zojin practices, as you, you're saying, it, it's important to have a foundational practice, which is partly why the Lamas and Rinpoches advise doing Mahamudra. So there's always a foundational practice. And this might be just simply looking at how the foundation, whatever our foundation is, peace, equanimity, openness, clarity, whatever our foundational essence is, how that arises. So we do a very short foundational practice. And then you do a very simple shamatha practice of just simply becoming aware of the breath for a few breaths. And then rest back in open awareness. Rest back as this open and vast and limitless being. And then in, in a variety of different ways, you're suddenly introduced to the nature of mind as being Rigpa or pure awareness or pristine awareness, that pure awareness that has no bounds within which everything arises. So that, that in essence is in a, in a capsule is how that is taught. And the, the, it's the introduction to pure awareness that is that involves lots of these particular practices, these cutting through practices and that's part of the you know the flavor the beautiful flavors of um, zojin are those pointing out practices which are very famous and there are different as i you know you and i have both said there are different personalities on our planet and some are more attracted to mahamudra and a progressive path and some are more attracted to the direct inquiry and as all the rimpshes point out a Mahamudra meditator will respect the Zojin meditator, and a Zojin meditator will respect the Mahamudra meditator. In other words, the progressive path uh, practitioners respect the direct inquiry and vice versa. And if you learn both, that's very be beneficial. And as you said in the beginning, what we do in our practices is we assist people to learn both. And I think that really speaks and to And I, th I think that. even if somebody is practitioner so to speak, of one versus the other, 
there's going to be some elements of the other side that are drawn to the practice into the practice out of necessity um so exactly. anyways exactly. let's uh so we'll do a, a very short practice and uh and and one thing i i would encourage everybody listening is whatever practice you do don't become too tight about it <laughs> if, you're, if you're convinced it's the only one then you might be getting a bit tight and so loosen up into this kind of oh because the key is really to be open and fresh like a child and then in that kind of divine childlike nature you actually all, all these miracles and wonders of our planet and all these practices that we are doing really do truly become revealed so i'll just share with you a very simple beginning and this is so easy it's basically effortless so wherever you are if you're driving the car you might want to sit and stop certainly just park or you might want to pause and come back to this later so we're just going to go to the most essential points of any of the Zojin practices. And that is that every experience we have can be viewed as this open awareness, this clarity and this vast, open, empty awareness within which everything arises, just as Kevin was instructing you. So all we're going to do is surrender to that. We're going to rest back and allow every experience to unfold as pure awareness. So get comfortable first, as we talk about in uh, raising our vibration practices, preparation is really important. Just, just rest back into this simple, peaceful, very deep and restful place almost as if you're resting back in the arms of a mother or a father or a, a place of really great peace, you might find that it's, that you can go to the place that you found really great peace sometime in your life. So you're just resting in that for a moment. Your eyes can be open or closed. And I want you to feel into this place or space of an experience or an image that helps you surrender. Quite often it's just a natural thing, something really simple. It could be as a child or a teenager or even an adult where maybe you just had a moment in life where you were lying outside and on the grass, kind of looking up at the sky. And just, life just seemed very simple, very peaceful. So it's that basically, you're just connecting. So this is connecting with your foundation, whatever the foundation is for you. You just bring to mind, bring to heart the feelings and the sensations around this. It's that simple. So here's your foundation. You're just resting in the nature of your own being effortlessly. And now that you're resting back in that very peaceful, very equanimous or tranquil or serene place, feeling, sensation, just as Kevin was guiding you. See if you can bring the awareness of that down and into your feet. So you, now you're just shifting attention and awareness, bringing that same equanimity and tranquility into your feet. Letting it flow up your body into your hands, which are cupped in your lap, and letting it flow up your body all the way up your spine, as if there's a string pulling you by the top of your head. So it's really simple. You're just bringing awareness and attention as peace or tranquility with a degree of flexibility and then notice where your breath settles you might find you breathe in the nostrils or in the chest or in the belly wherever it naturally settles so this is this brief moment of shamatha practice and just noticing the breath noticing the inhalation all the way from the point that the breath begins for the duration of the inhalation to that gap, 
moving all the way on the exhalation. Let's do two, three breaths of this really simple flow. And whatever the quality was that you're resting back as that peace or tranquility, just feel that same sensation of peace or tranquility in the breath. It's so simple. We're just resting back as that peace. And now just simply rest back, really open your heart, open awareness to the fact that we're doing this for everybody, being on the planet. And that those of us that are practicing this together are doing this right now, simultaneously right now with everyone else who's listening to this. There's a great power of collective awareness here. We're tuning into this opportunity to be open and deep and vast and clear. And with a deep sense of gratitude, so this is the devotional aspect of it, we just bring gratitude for all the blessings of our teachers or ancestors, family, friends, neighbors, those gathered around us. We really open up to the blessings of all beings, almost as if we can feel their compassion and love flowing into us as we rest back. So we really feel this interconnectedness. Just that. As if all this wisdom and energy is pouring into you. And then when we rest back again, we do these brief resting moments as open awareness. We just drop all effort, drop all expectations, any stories or narrative, any judgments about what's happening now. Just give yourself permission to simply rest, to be open. Awareness. Just to be open with whatever arises. You don't even need to meditate. This is the most natural, effortless practice in the world. Just to rest naturally naturally in awareness, open. And then we'll do one brief practice where you just notice what's happening in your body right now with this open awareness. You stay resting back as this open, tranquil serenity. And just notice any sensations that arise. It's so effortless. You're just feeling these unfolding sensations in your body. Not as objects, but just simply like waves in an ocean, experiences playing out in a field of openness and clarity, as if they're playing in the field of awareness. It is rising in the field of awareness. It's as if your body is happening in this ocean of awareness, like a wave. All the body sensations you're experiencing are also like waves on the surface of this ocean of purest awareness. And you're just relaxing, resting back as that peace or tranquility, resting into that full expanse that has no boundary, that limitless boundless awareness and allowing these body sensations, these experiences of the body to unfold and arise 
Hacen lo bueno así. Eso pues. Now you can just drop any attention to the body you want, any focus. We don't need to orient towards any experiences. And we don't need to ignore them. We're not grasping onto them, nor are we pushing them away. We're just resting. Ah, this open, effortless awareness. What a remarkable opportunity. Just to rest as this open, tranquil, fast. your eyes are closed, slowly open your eyes. And if your eyes are already open, continue resting as this delightful, innocent freshness, as if everything that you see is within this beautiful, open, fresh awareness. It's like a divine child. In the same way as your body sensations were like waves on the ocean. So everything you see around you, all the objects, your walls, the sky, all waves in the ocean of awareness. What you see arises. Always. You recognize all this with the delight and freshness of the young child in the temple. Same as when you move. You begin to recognize you are moving as awareness itself. That there's this openness and freshness and beauty to this free, tranquil serenity of movement, that every movement is an expression of this pure and boundless awareness. So as you take a look around at the world around you and all its details, you simply take in with a sense of incredible relief and effortlessness, the beauty and the richness of this moment and this moment, noticing how everything, including all the moments, all of time, all of space, happens within this pure and infinite, indivisible, timeless awareness. So thank you truly to all, everybody listening and feeling thank you truly for your boundlessness and your always immaculate presence. Thank you, Stephen, for that beautiful guidance. And thank you all for watching and listening and practicing along with us. And if you'd like to learn more about practices like this, of subtle energy, of awareness, uh, please visit us at raisingourvibration.net. And there you can learn more about our community of practice. And also you can email us with any questions you have. So thank you once again. We'll see you same place next week. And bye for now. <laughs>